Okay, I'm going to introduce you briefly and then the floor is yours. So it's a pleasure to welcome Thomas Held. Um, Thomas Held received his master's in computational visual visualistics from University of Koblenz in Germany in 2008 and did his PhD in computer science at Kaus King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And he now holds a position as assistant professor in the computational biology center uh, at Leiden University Medical Center and is also a research fellow at Delft University of Technology. And I'm looking forward to your talk, Thomas. And um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, as you already said, I have uh, positions both in, in the Computational Biology Center in Leiden and the Computer Graphics uh, and Visualization Group in Delft. So here's basically the people I work with uh, mostly, and this is a nice mix of people from the hospital and from the graphics group. And uh, so my, my main focus then obviously is uh, trying to combine these, these two things. So uh, doing computer graphics or visualization in the context of uh, computational biology. Um, and today I want to talk about uh, our work on single cell analysis. And uh, we have a nice tool, uh, which is a mass cytometer. And uh, I, yeah, let's start with some motivation. So basically the idea is that um, depending or people just react differently to a disease and the, the treatment. So uh, if you treat uh, two patients that have the same disease, it, it's not necessarily that they show the same reactions. And usually there are differences in the immune system that, that are res responsible for this. And uh, with this mass cytometer, we can actually analyze uh, immune cells uh, taken from blood or tissue samples really on a single cell level. So we can take a, a blood sample from two patients and then uh, compare those uh, looking at, at single cells. So, this mass cytometry is a very recent development. It's just available for three years now. Um, and the idea is that uh, we can stain single cells with heavy metals. Um, so there is a, a previous technique that has been used for decades uh, that is uh, flow cytometry, where basically you stain the cells with uh, fluorescent markers. But this actually gives a lot of overlap in the spectrum and that allows you to, to measure only up to like 10, 15 different features on the cell. And with the mass cytometry, we can get many more. Uh, so uh, on the slides, it says up to 40, but actually we are basically limited by the number of heavy metals that we can acquire. And, um, Basically, it is expected that this will be up to roughly 100 in the, in the not so long future. So the workflow is, is basically like this. You, you get the, the cell is coming in. Uh, as I said, it is uh, labeled with these heavy metals, and then it goes into a glass pipe where it, every cell is uh, contained in a single water droplet. And then it is shot through this vaporizer where the the this whole cell is burned and out comes basically a cloud of of uh, non-organic remains they are still filtered so we only have these heavy metals that were attached and then we can easily measure this in the time of flight fashion in the mass cytometer mass spectrometer um and uh yeah on the bottom right here you see like the signal that really is a we we get really nice uh data out of this with very sharp peaks very little overlap, very little noise. So this is really, really nice data to analyze. Um, as I said, we have about 40 uh, different proteins or markers we can measure at the same time. But actually, if we look at the whole immune system, we have uh, about 10,000 proteins that uh, have uh, influence on the, the functionality of cells. So we still have to uh, specifically design these, these marker panels or select these 40, 50 markers that we are interested in uh, to 
to actually the problem that we are interested in. So that means we really have to do data-driven analysis here because Basically, every study has a different set of markers, and then we cannot just look up uh, in, in a table uh, what every of these, these combinations would mean. In addition to that, we typically have cohort studies nowadays. Uh, so if we take a single blood sample from a single patient that can contain up to a few hundred thousand cells, and we pool those with, over multiple patients, uh, maybe over multiple time steps and then uh, a typical data set consists of millions of cells. Um, and if we take a step back again to the to the markers, so this this increase in, in, in markers compared to the clinical standard, the flow cytometry, basically gives us uh, two, two possible uh, passes for exploration and the one is we can look into the immune system in more depth. So basically, we, we are interested in a specific cell type, like in this example here, the T lymphocytes, and then we can use this increase in markers to, to further and further differentiate within this one type of cells. But what we can also do is look at the immune system in more breadth. So we can basically explore multiple lineages of cells at the same time. and, and get a, an overview over the whole immune system um, in, in one measurement. Or not the whole, as I said, uh, we're only looking still at a tiny fraction, but uh, in, in principle, we can also look at the interaction of different cell types, which was very rarely done before. Um, the analysis pipeline basically looks like this. We get our sample in, uh, we get uh, run it through the machine and then we get a table that uh, contains the expression of these different markers of the cell types. So that it's basically just a table where we every cell is a row and every column is one of these markers that we measure, uh, where we measure the quantity of the, the metals that were attached to the cell. And then what we want to do with this, we want to identify the cell types based on the expression profiles. So this can be really a different cell, but it can also be a different a developmental stage and so on. And then based on this, uh, we want to do quantitative analysis to build something like an immune signature for that person. And as I said, we have uh, uh, cohort studies, so we would build these immune signatures for, for the different uh, person, people in our study, and then we can see if there are differences and maybe that is in relation to why some people react differently to the treatment than others. And uh, so what I'm focusing on today is really this middle part where we're gonna go from the, the, yeah, this high dimensional cell expression data to labeling these cells. Okay, and yeah, this is basically the, the phenotype specification. So traditionally, um, when we had like 10 different markers, the, the workflow was like this, that you, you would select two markers, uh, plot them in a scatter plot, like you see on the bottom, uh, two of these markers on the two axes, and then uh, every point is a cell. And you would say, okay, I'm interested in, uh, say, high expression in marker A and low expression in marker B. So it would be that uh, rectangle that is shown here. Now you would take the cells that are in there and select two different markers and would uh, get a new plot with just this selection and you would see differentiation uh, by doing this multiple times, you could really drill into a certain uh, specific cell type. So now this on the top right here, you see basically the, the expression vector for these six uh, markers and that uh, would give you the cell type. However, well, there are two main problems here. One is that you have a large user bias. So if you think about this first plot, uh, say we, we are interested more in high expression in marker B and low expression in marker A, we could put the rectangle like this. But since now we don't have a clear separation, like for the blue box, now where to put this box is really dependent on the analysis. 
So uh, different people or different uh, users would put this box at a different position, and then you get a different quantification at the end. Um, and another obvious problem is if we have 40 markers, or well, now we all of a sudden just looking at high and low expression, not even looking at the different uh, uh, transitions in between, we get two to the power of 40 combinations. So doing a manual pipeline like this is, is impossible. Um, and well, it's not surprising then that there has been quite a bit of work in, in computational ana analysis in the last couple of years. And uh, they basically for, um, separate into two main groups. And the one is the clustering-based approaches. You see on the left two examples. And the other groups are dimensionality reduction-based approaches. So the clustering-based approaches, you basically or well, you cluster the data. So you find groups of similar cells. And then uh, in these two examples, they somehow uh, visualize these uh, groups as points in the graph. In the dimensionality reduction-based approaches, you retain access to single cells. So every point in these plots here is a single cell, but we reduce the dimensionality. So taking these 4D markers, we try to uh, represent them by just two um, uh, that we can then plot on the two axes of a, of a regular scatter plot. And this is usually done uh, nowadays with TSNE. So in, at least in this domain, a lot of people use TSNE. And uh, well, in case you're not familiar with, with TSNE, I just have two slides uh, very briefly to explain what it does. So basically, the uh, TSNE is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So uh, if you compare it, for example, to PCA, which is probably much wider known, PCA just finds the main, main axis of variation. So it's a linear technique, and uh, it, it's really focused on variation. Uh, I, sorry, I have some echo right now. OK, something went off. One second. OK. So uh, as I said, PCA is a, a linear technique where you find the major axis of variation, whereas in TSNE, you're not so much interested in the global uh, differences in the variation, but rather in local uh, uh, differences. So for example, if you look at this example of the Swiss roll here on the left, so in case you cannot see it, uh, the structure is basically something like this. So this is this uh, typical Swiss roll example where you have a, a 2D manifold that is rolled up in, in 3D space. And now uh, if you want to reconstruct this uh, or uh, use dimensionality reduction here to get this to, to a 2D space, like, well, of course, you see it on a 2D space now. So basically, you already have a linear projection on the left. But it might be more interesting to see something like the unrolled manifold, as you can see on the right. So basically, if you if you if you have a nonlinear dimensionality reduction, the goal could be to get something like you see on the right. So now, in fact, uh, TSNE is not very good with the uh, Swiss roll example, but for uh, real world data, it actually performs quite well if you're interested in clusters. So the idea of TSNE is you compute local neighborhoods in the high dimensional space, and then you model a low dimensional, in this case, two dimensional space to, that, that preserves these neighborhoods. And by preserving the local neighborhoods, you also preserve clusters in the high dimensional space. So the main goal of TSNE is really uh, con conserving clusters in the high dimensional space when you visualize in the low dimensional space. However, uh, well, TSNE is computationally really intensive. Um, and if you have lots of data, then you run into crowding problems. So um, the way these neighborhoods are computed in the high dimensional space, you, you tend to actually lose precision when you add data, a, a lot of data. I will, I will have an example in, in a couple of slides. Um, 
So there has been some work on uh, uh, optimizing TSNE. So now what you see on the right is basically uh, a bounce hot SNE approach where you see uh, the the 2D layout being optimized uh, on the fly using a force directed layout in the low dimensional space. And uh, we had some work in the lab uh, a couple of years ago where uh, Nicola Pizzotti, a PhD student in the lab, uh, he proposed to approximate the high dimensional neighborhoods, which gave us a speed up of, depending on the dimensionality of up to 100 uh, times with uh, virtually indistinguishable results. So that is really nice, especially in the combination now with the bonds up. As you see on the right, we have very little pre-processing and then immediately can see the, the map evolving. Um, so in terms of performance, this is already, these two approaches are nice steps to go further. But as I mentioned, there's also this problem of, of crowding. And uh, well, with these uh, uh, performance improvements, we could actually run a TSNE on 5 million cells that you see here uh, on the right. Well, it still needs quite a bit of time. So 250 hours to compute this map. Uh, it takes a computer with uh, nearly 100 gigs of memory. And then actually what you see, uh, and that relates to this crowding problem, not only in the visual space, but you also see that uh, you see actually less structure than in this 1 million cell embedding here on the left. So this 1 million cells, they are a random sample of the 5 million cells on the, on the right. And you see actually that there are quite a few clusters uh, here in this, in this blue part that you cannot find here. So here you have uh, these two major clusters and then maybe two smaller ones in between. And here we actually have quite a few uh, small clusters that do not show up at all. So there is some, some problem with the resolving of the neighborhoods if you just throw more and more data of it, uh, at it. Um, so in, in our uh, analysis framework site explorer, we, we tried actually to, to combine the, the computational uh, improvements and also find ways to uh, improve these, these or go to more data sizes, higher, larger data sizes and retain precision. So I've shown this slide before, right? So uh, when we talk to our partners in the hospital in Leiden, what they actually want to do with this, we figured out that they are really interested in, in looking at the immune system in more breadth. So they want to explore multiple cell types at the same time. And uh, when we when we realized this, basically it was very, very uh, clear that maybe a, a hierarchical approach would be helpful for this. So basically we, we could build a hierarchy where we uh, first look at the main branches, then we separate it into the main cell branches, and then we can still use a TSNE approach to look at the, the branches separately. And we have published this in, in uh, Eurobis in, in 2016 and also there's a pilot study uh, published that uses this approach and uh, there we used clustering and TSNE combined so we used the spade clustering to basically find the major branches and then we used uh, TSNE to to plot the separate branches so there we have up to a million points uh, in a single plot and that still somewhat worked However, um, it still is a bit of a, of a hack, so to say. So you have two techniques you have to learn. You only have two levels in the hierarchy you can look at. So uh, we actually thought it, it is probably a better way to do this. And at the same time, uh, at Eurovis, uh, the Nicola Pizzotti also presented hierarchical stochastic neighbor embedding, which is basically a hierarchical version of TSME. And uh, while we use this also, we implemented this in, in Cytosplot then and used this on this single cell data. And uh, we actually get very, very nice results, as if you will see in, in the next few slides. So the idea is basically the following. So we have a uh, dimensionality reduction again as before. 
So very similar to TSNE. So we have this, uh, in this case, toy example of a three-dimensional space here. And we want to reduce the dimensionality to just two. But instead of now finding uh, or, or looking at a single um, plot that contains all of the information, now we actually have this hierarchical approach where we find a, a very abstract representation that you can see here in the middle, where we aggregate uh, several cells to a single, what we call a landmark. So that a landmark is basically a representative cell. And then we, we uh, plot only this, this aggregate representation. And uh, we actually retain the, the, uh, the similarities of the whole data set, even on this abstract representation. So the, you see, basically, you have these clusters that represent uh, these, these areas. Uh, but they are still sort of in a similar uh, layout as you would expect uh, if you'd have just a single plot. And then the, <clears throat> um, we allow to interactively explore this hierarchy. So you could select, for example, the screen cluster and uh, ask for more detail, and then we, you get the, the uh, full data level uh, for this uh, green cluster only. And in fact, you can have multiple levels in this hierarchy. So not, you're not limited to these two levels you see in this toy example here. So the way this, is, this works is basically a, a bottom-up approach. So we start with the data level, with the full uh, data resolution. And then we aggregate cells through these representative dimensions. So this is what we call the landmarks. And we select these landmarks based on their local connectivity. So if there is a cell uh, or a, a point here in, in this uh, uh, neighborhood graph, you see here on the bottom right that has a very high connectivity, this is, uh, has a high probability to be selected as a landmark. And then um, we define on the, the levels above this the similarity uh, between these landmarks by uh, defining what we call the area of influence, which is basically the cells that are in this uh, local connectivity of these landmarks. I, I hope you can see this, but it is indicated here by these uh, light gray regions in, in this uh, plot. So when we define this so, uh, uh, area of influence, you see that the area of influence of several landmarks can overlap. And the degree of this overlap basically tells us how similar those landmarks are. So we built these neighborhood graphs here on the higher level based on the uh, uh, overlap in the area of influence. And by doing so, we still have basically the similarity uh, even on this, this higher levels based on the original neighborhood graph. So you see that, for example, these two landmarks, you do not want to connect them because in the original graph, they, they are also not connected directly. But if you would just randomly uh, select these points and then uh, do a nearest neighbor graph, uh, for example, here, you would probably connect these two points in this graph. Whereas uh, using this area of influence, they are only connected through this uh, longer way uh, through these other landmarks. So this really retains this nonlinear uh, relationships throughout uh, all of the levels of the hierarchy. Um, so what we can do with this, uh, one very simple thing that we tested is uh, we took this data set uh, as that you see here on the left, uh, which was published uh, in, by Samusik et al. Uh, they uh, have a method called Vortex, which is the clustering, and then they show the clusters in a directed layout, as you can see on the left. And on the right, we did the same with HSNE, where we just picked one level of the hierarchy. So the data set consists of around a million cells. We build a hierarchy of three levels, and then we just pick the third level, so the highest level in, in this hierarchy. And then we also clustered this. So Based, based on the layout in the in the plot. And uh, 
what you see actually, or what what you can see if you if you look compare really the clusters that we see, that we get very similar results. Um, however, uh, computing the clusters in Vortex took uh, 22 hours, and doing it with HSE takes roughly five minutes on the same computer. So we already have a very strong performance improvement there, but um, uh, oh, maybe also what's what's interesting here is, for example, that you get very similar structure even. So if you look at this this part here where we have two uh, different CD4 uh, cells, so you see actually that the same cells are over here, and even the 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 shape of this uh, uh, this group is very similar to what happens if you do the the uh, uh, HSNE layout. So uh, as I said, this is much faster already at this point. But actually, what is the major strength of the HSNE is uh, in the vortex. You you visualize thirty thousand clusters or cells, and uh, basically that's it. So if you want to now find out more about these clusters, you have to somehow export the data, uh, run a new analysis. But in the TSNE, uh, in the HSNE, you can now just select any of these groups and zoom in for more detail. So you can go in the next level of the hierarchy and actually add the cells that are in that level of the hierarchy and uh, get the full uh, up to the full data resolution of 1 million cells. So the exploration is basically uh, top to bottom. So you start with some overview that uh, the user defines how many level they want to have. And they start with this overview, for example. So here we're looking at a data set uh, of uh, 5 million cells that uh, we had uh, analyzed in this uh, pilot study with the original site explorer. Now we reanalyze this with uh, HSNE. So these are 5 million cells in total. Um, and we build a hierarchy of five levels. So this is just a visualization of the top level of the hierarchy. So every point here is one of the landmarks. They are positioned by their similarity. And we use color in this case to uh, show one of the dimensions. So in this case, the CD7 marker. So uh, red color means that marker is highly expressed pressed in these regions where blue means they are not so high expressed. So um, or, I spare you the details, but uh, when we cluster this actually and uh, look at the full expression of these clusters, we can basically immediately identify the major branches of the immune system here. So each of these uh, colored groups is really one of the major cell types that we found uh, in this data set. And they really nicely separate already on this high level of the HSNE. So what we can do now, as I said, we could, for example, select these, these uh, blue group here, the innate lymphocytes, and uh, request more uh, detail on this one. So we would now basically get a, a second plot where we uh, add the points from the next level of the hierarchy, and then uh, we would create a new layout. And what you also see here is that we basically have three major clusters here. And they really correspond to the three clusters that you see here in, in this overview plot already. And um, we can actually interactively explore this also in the software so that you can really verify this. Um, and let me show you just a demonstration of this. So this is uh, uh, our software framework. Uh, this is the same data I just described. Um, I think we're actually looking at the fourth level of the hierarchy in this case. And uh, while everything else, we're looking at one marker that is defined here using the color. Um, and the position again is, is the similarity. So now uh, we can cluster this interactively. So here we have a density representation that we can adjust on the fly. And then based on this density representation, we can also cluster the data. So basically, uh, every peak in the density now corresponds to one cluster. And uh, well, I can now uh, select this or also visualize these clusters. 
and the expression in a heat map. So now what you see on the right is a heat map visualization of the clusters. Every column is one of the clusters, and then every row is one of the uh, dimensions or markers that we actually show. A uh, use for the computation of the of the uh, HSME. So you see, I can interactively uh, select these clusters and then uh, get uh, information which of these uh, they are in the map. Um, but now I want to get more detail. For example, in this uh, group where over here. So now uh, I can just uh, select this, say drill into selection or into the cluster. Um, so these are the innate lymphocytes I mentioned before. And then we get a second view where the uh, the neighborhood, the embedding is, is computed uh, on the fly. And we can already interact with this while this is being computed. And uh, oh, Let's move a bit forward. So I can now, for example, also select in this plot. And it shows up over here. It's a bit hard to see. Let's do it the other way around. So you see here, I select here, and then it's highlighted in this plot. So I can really verify that these are indeed the same clusters as I mentioned before. But now uh, I get more detail. And in this case, also what we see, so now I'm coloring this by uh, the disease, actually. So we have, uh, as I said, uh, a pool of, of uh, subjects here. And uh, some of them have different diseases. So green is uh, control, I think. Uh, uh, purple is uh, Crohn's disease. And then we have the red part here, which is a, a later stage of Crohn's disease. And we actually see that this group of cells really only is present in this uh, later stage of, of the disease. So uh, we can already identify groups of cells that are really seem to be specific for, for a certain disease. OK. Um, let me introduce just briefly a couple of uh, case studies we did with this. So one thing we did is we re reanalyzed this uh, study that we did with the original Cytosplore, uh, the original SPADE and TSNE based workflow. So actually, what we, we had to do quite a bit of downsampling there. So we had actually 5 million cells. And we had to remove uh, 3 million just to be able to, uh, to run the TSNE properly for all of the major lineages. Uh, and then we clustered this with a different tool. And actually, this. Uh, this tool only clusters the data very close to the density peak. So uh, it removed uh, 1 million or did not classify 1 million of the points in the TSNE plots. So we only were left with roughly 1 million uh, cells uh, that we then in the end classified. And the color here now corresponds to one of the classes. Um, so we read that this analysis, and again, this is the same data set I've shown before. So here are just a few more of the markers visualized. Um, and let us let me show one example here of the CD4 uh, T cells. So those are T lymphocytes where the CD4 marker is highly expressed. So we select this and zoom in, and then we get uh, uh, this structure. And you see here, for example, it's interesting that we have this little uh, blob here where this CD28 marker uh, is not expressed and is, it's quite far from, from the other regions where this is the case. So we zoomed into this one. And actually, then on the data level, we, we get these plots. Uh, what's interesting here is uh, this plot here on the right, um, where we show the subsets that we identified uh, in the original study in red, but everything that has been removed in the original study due to downsampling and, and not classifying it is uh, the gray and the black. And you see basically that in this upper left region here, there's hardly any red. So we basically missed this compartment completely in the original study. And we see actually that there's still differentiation here on, this, on the data level. So we see uh, really this part, uh, the CD56 marker is not expressed. 
So we only found in the original study uh, cells where the CD56 marker for this particular uh, subset was expressed, but we completely missed this part. And it also seems that this part actually has some, some uh, um, uh, yeah, it's really uh, linked to to actually the RCD2, and in this case also there's some control, but it's really not in the in the Crohn's disease, for example. So by having the full uh, data resolution, uh, not relying on downsampling, which is now possible with the HSME, we can really uh, make sure that we do not miss important details such as these. In another case study uh, that was recently published, uh, we actually uh, looked at the development of the TSNE computation. So I've shown before how the map actually evolves over time, like this 2D map. And uh, you might ask yourself, why is this uh, relevant, right? I can just wait for it to be finished. I'm just interested in the final clusters anyways. But um, well, we, our partners uh, in the hospital, they, they had the stool as is, so they uh, looked at how the map evolved, and then they actually realized that there seemed to be something in there. So uh, if we look at these plots here, um, this is the TSNE evolution of an a, a innate lymphocyte data set. Um, from left to right, and you see how the, the structure actually evolves until you get the final uh, result. But uh, what they figured out is it seemed that there is some uh, differentiation in this part, you know, also this part. So they were interested in, in what is going on there. Um, and uh, so what they, they did, they did this uh, evolution, they looked at this evolution, they saw this, uh, this branching out, and then uh, we actually allowed them in, in the tool, we allowed them to stop also the evolution, to pause it and go further. So they, they stopped it and they, they actually looked at these cells. So they stopped it somewhere in the middle of this, uh, of the embedding. And then they looked at these, at basically this, what they expected here, the red part, the branching point and where it goes up and where it goes down. So now uh, the, the, the line here corresponds to the x-axis over here, and we're looking at a few uh, markers in the expression. And you see that this uh, CD8A marker, for example, has a rather high expression on the left side, but then it goes down in the middle, and then it goes up. So what they assumed, actually, um, is that here in the middle, they found a precursor cell that differentiates, so this or two actually in this case, that differentiates into natural killer cells you see on the left here and uh, ILCs you see on the right. And it was not really known that, that actually these cells have had, had not been shown before in humans, only in mice. They were expected to be uh, in humans, but they had not been shown until this point. And uh, it was also not clear if they, if they could really uh, separate into these two cell types. So now, of course, by just looking at this plot, it is, uh, uh, yeah, you, you can build this hypothesis, but that's, of course, is not proof. So they went into the lab, they actually separated these cells and cultivated them. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, they looked if they could indeed, this, this type of cell could uh, separate or develop into both of these cells and actually they found this to be true. So uh, by looking at the development of the map, they could form this hypothesis of this developmental uh, pathways of the cells and then they could verify this uh, in the lab. Okay. Um, that brings me back now to the HSNE. So, um, well, the, the previous study was, was being done with just the TSNE. We had uh, not as many cells in there. But uh, really, to get uh, these large studies, we, we now use uh, uh, HSNE over here. But, uh, and and it, it works really well, but there's a but. So um, if you think about this, 
So this is, again, a typical example here. You see a view of the uh, application and the workflow is you, you select something, you zoom in, uh, you do this for different regions. Uh, maybe you zoom into more detail in newly developed regions. So you very quickly um, get to lots and lots of plots that you sort of have to mentally map. Uh, you have to know where you have been uh, uh, where do you need to go further? You, there's there's very little indication of where actually more detail is needed and where not. So we moved this computational problem uh, uh, that, that made it impossible to really do these large-scale studies computationally, but now we have uh, a user interaction problem. Or, uh, yeah, the user now really has to, to, to keep track of so at this last year, we uh, presented uh, a little tool that basically uh, helps uh, in, in guiding the uh, hierarchy exploration and also uh, is allows to present the, the final exploration for, for uh, um, yeah, reproduction. So uh, for the exploration, we basically uh, we, we did a little, uh, we did a small field study where we wanted to figure out what is really needed here. And, and basically, yeah, the, we have these uh, three points here. So we want to help and the exploration to navigate the hierarchy. So this, we want to use this, uh, this uh, separate visualization also to, to, uh, for user interaction. We want to identify interesting regions, and these can be structural or functional. So structural means there's a, a variation in the TSNE plot or HSNE plot, and functional means there's variation in one of the markers, at least one of the markers. And we also want to keep track and identify regions where we've already been, so we, we do not go into the same regions multiple times. So basically on the right, you see our final design for this. And uh, I guess in the sake of time, I, I skip a bit here, but in principle, uh, you have uh, like these embedded visualizations um, where we start with the, the original map here. And uh, we cluster this map, and then we put this ring around this map with uh, where every segment corresponds to one of the clusters. And then we show a heat map for the markers where we show actual, actually the standard variation instead of the expression. And the standard deviation gives us this functional variation. So it tells us really um, where there is uh, still room to uh, explore. So if you look at this in the, in the Red part here, there's uh, much less dark uh, than there's here in the purple part, even though like structurally those two blobs or those two clusters look very much alike. So this one, the, the purple one, is much more interesting to explore than, than this one. And then uh, we can, from here, directly zoom in. So we can just click this, say zoom in, and we get more detail uh, for, for this part. And then we basically have the second plot I've shown before, but now we cluster this and also add it to this visualization. So now we slowly build up our hierarchy like this. And um, in the end, we get like our final uh, uh, result that looks something like this. And uh, this, this really helps us to, to navigate the hierarchy, but also to yeah, to interact with it directly. Okay, so there are some things that we did there to also make it uh, uh, to, to really ad adapt to the different sizes we see there. So for example, for the scatter plot, uh, you've seen that in the middle, it's usually much larger, you get very different sizes there. So if we would just simply scale it, that's uh, here the upper row, you see, for example, this uh, purple cluster, this would really get lost over here. So we did some adaptive scaling to make sure that even in the small representations, uh, these details are still visible. And similarly, for the heat maps, uh, at some point, we just don't have enough space for the uh, to show all of the markers. So then we just show the, the one marker with the highest standard deviation. 
and the corresponding standard deviation. But you can still get the full one on demand uh, if you look at this. Um, uh, so here's an example uh, in action. So now you see on the right how we actually uh, interact with this. So we can zoom in. Uh, and the, the new map is computed on the fly. Uh, it will be added on the right. And we can also use it to interact. So we can now click on these embeddings uh, over on the right, and we see the full version on the left. We can click on the markers and see actually where this variation shows up. Uh, and so on. All right, um, that brings me to a brief outlook. So what we are actually doing at the moment. And uh, one of the most important things or most interesting, exciting things uh, we have in the lab right now is we have an imaging version of this mass cytometry. So basically we get uh, uh, images uh, at nanoscale, nanometer resolution where we can really see the single cells in the images and we get the same uh, staining that we had before. So we have now 40 dimensions per pixel instead of per cell. And then in the example you see on the right, we actually have segmented the cells and then we show the uh, uh, aggregate uh, expression now for one marker in this case uh, for every cell. And you see already that, that there's really nice uh, structure here uh, with, with the different the expression really uh, different for different parts of this piece of tissue. And here's another example. So the same tissue, another marker, and uh, it's even more obvious here that we have uh, on the outer part here, there seems to be something really going on that is very different from this inner part. Um, now this is just showing the expression of a single marker, but uh, we we have this we have the same pipeline basically available that I presented. So we can now do a TSNE on these cells. We can cluster this. So that is what you see here. The color corresponds to the cluster, and then we can uh, also look at the different cell types uh, like this. So and then you see there seem to be some some cells that really act as uh, yeah, bridges between different pieces of this tissue, like the outer part here, and then we go into the inner part. So there's really a nice uh, transition. So this is really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, so the most, most exciting part is now we can also look at cell interaction. So uh, do cells of the same type actually, do they behave differently if they are in different parts of the tissue and so on? And uh, another thing that we are working on is basically is, is single cell transcriptomics. So there we have uh, thousands of genes instead of just uh, 10 to 40, 50 markers now. Um, and nowadays we also get millions of cells. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, transcriptomics would be uh, bulk and you get like a few samples. But now, actually, there's, for example, this 10x megacell data sets, data set, which consists of uh, 1.3 million cells with, uh, I think, uh, 40,000 genes. So uh, this is technically quite, uh, it, it's very similar. But of course, there are some challenges. Uh, like for example, in the transcriptomics, you have a much higher dropout rate, much more noise than in the site of data. And uh, also in the user interaction, or actually the, the, the visualization, is that you uh, now have, like, we, we can easily show these 40 markers, uh, as I've shown before in the heat maps. But uh, yeah, if you have thousands, then, then this really becomes a problem to select uh, the interesting ones. So there are some ways to do automatic gene filtering and so on. But in principle, this is uh, also a very nice uh, extension that we're looking at right now. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Questions? Just a quick question, Thomas. Very good talk. Uh, you can't see me. I'm sitting in the corner, Oliver. Can you can you say something about the size of the tissue samples that you have shown, like the previous uh, just to get an idea roughly? In, in terms of uh, pixels or, or? 
Uh, actual spatial size? Yeah, nanometers or even micrometers, I don't know. Yeah, this is like uh, uh, a few, uh, at, at most a millimeter square, something like this. So it's, it's really, uh, really small patches. So the cells are on a micrometer scale? Oh, I, I said nanometer, right? I, I, micrometer is, uh, the, the uh, cell is in the micrometer scale and uh, we get like a millimeter of, of tissue there, square millimeter, yeah. Okay, further questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in the next talk. Um, I'm here. <laughs> and um, I would like to know um, how the technical part, how did you, um, or which uh, language did you use, or how did you implement the HSNE? Um, um, so the HSNE is implemented, or basically the whole framework is implemented in C, uh, C. Mm -hmm. um, the HSNE is open source. Uh, at uh, Nicolas uh, GitHub repository. I can share the link also afterwards. I, I realize I don't have it on the slides. And at uh, yeah, siteexplore.org, you can also download the software. That's not open source, but it's free, uh, free to use. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah, I it's an alternative performance by if you're also looking to write the projections for your very large data sets. Into uh, sorry, random projections. No, not really. So we we had a look at some other techniques. Uh, or actually, there's a lot of uh, work also in the field. On uh, so people are using uh, uh, diffusion maps and other techniques, for example. But but uh, random projections, I didn't look at. No. Um, Thomas, I have a question. So you talk mostly about mass cytometry, where you have 40 parameters for each cell. But you know that there are, and maybe that's the data set you mentioned at the very end, um, like yeah. RNA seq, so sequencing data for a single cell. Uh, and there yeah. you're really able to track which cell has originated from which other tumor cell. So you could track the evolution of how a tumor progresses. Um, did yeah. you? Do you have access to such data? Did you consider to do it? Because then it's also like this ordering problem. It's not that you would consider each cell as an independent uh, entity. Yeah, so we are starting uh, to acquire some data uh, in LIDAR like this. Um, we have a, a yeah, pilot version of the site explorer running with this data, but uh, so far it's mostly like really transitioning the techniques we have. Uh, to the data or adapting this and not really going further with uh, looking at the, what you describe. Um, but okay. in, in principle, yeah, these, these things are very interesting. It's the, the developmental pathways is definitely one thing that's, that's on the list, yes. Okay, maybe we can have a follow-up discussion because we have a project that starts in summer on this evolution of, of tumors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? If not, then let's thank Thomas again. Thank you. And the next talk that we have is given by Tammy Bubeker. Um, he's a professor uh, at Telecom Paris Tech, and he's talking about shape, approximate, uh, shape approximation of 3D surfaces, and this talk will be on the 23rd of April, which is Monday. Okay, Thomas, have a nice rest of the day. Good luck with your yes. like, finishing your BIS papers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.